let's get started and start looking at some of the questions. The first one's from Hilary. Uh, she's in Petersfield and she asks, does feeding supplements such as uh, Hive Alive fondant, which contains minerals, amino acids and vitamins, make a difference as to feeding with plain fondant? Uh, so is it is it as good or worse? Uh, Eleanor, what's your opinion on that? Just unmute myself so everybody can hear me. Um, my answer to that would be the same as it would to people um, taking supplements. If you have a deficiency in your diet or you're sort of struggling, you're recovering from an illness or something, then then they can be beneficial. But if you have a really good diet and you're generally quite healthy, it probably isn't going to make an awful lot of a lot of a difference to you. So one of the things you can do with your bees is is look around your local area. Do you have really good local forage? Is it diverse? Is it um, at the right times of year uh, of the year? So late um, late autumn, winter, early spring, and obviously June gap. Do you have that nice um, uh, that nice variety of food that they they they're going to get a proper diet? If you have any any deficiencies there or or you know you're you're in an area where there isn't a lot of diversity then yeah you're you're probably gonna see some improvement in your bees if if you give them that that beneficial stuff but um certainly in somerset we don't see that we've got a nice diverse area around here so you don't see it very often uh last spring when we had that really long period of terrible weather uh some of the smaller colonies really helped with feeding pollen supplement and and um the the additives uh, the effects that you get from uh, deficiency mineral deficiency is slow development of the larvae the larvae have got deformities and then they uh, if they do emerge into adult bees then you know they've they've probably not got a, a, enough um, they'll they'll be weaker and their lifespan will be severely shortened uh, Maggie, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think the only thing I, I'd add is so generally in the UK um, that there is that diverse range of, of, um, sort of nectar and pollen for, for bees. We don't sort of typically have the huge monocultures that you might sort of see in America and that. Um, so, you know, a lot of these supplements will have been developed for that in mind. Um, but yeah, obviously, if you, if you are concerned uh, about your bees and their, their nutrition, they, they are available. But I, th I think generally in this country, um, it, it's not really an issue. But as Alan, as Ellen, and I said um, if you keep an eye out for you know for for those signs and symptoms you, you can do something about it and there's a lot of these products out there now isn't there there seems to have been over the last few years there's uh, lots of different brands and and of course national bee unit we're not able to sort of uh, tell you which one to go and buy nor would we want to because that's not that's not the way we operate anyway but um yeah just have a shop around and i think largely they kind of all do the same same thing i, I used to feed my bees them uh, at around about this time, just as we're coming out of the um, the period leading out of the end of February into March, um, and it, it did give them a bit of a spring in their step, I thought, in 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 in, in sort of raising brood. Um, they always talk about that Ides of March, don't they? Because in March you've got you know the the old bees are dying out. There's lots of new bees coming in, but at the same time there's not a lot of um, nectar available to the bees but at the same time the queen is laying so there's more mouths to feed so often you'll get your bees all the way through the winter and you'll, and you'll look at yourself and beat your chest with delight in February but then in March you know you get that problem. Hilary thanks for that question and um, so the next question is from John uh, not me um, he sent some photos in I think um, Maggie has got those he John says uh, let me just read this uh, sadly I lost two colonies in January which were kept on an allotment. They were fine in December when I uh, checked them on a warm day. I gave them actually some supplemental fondant. So some supplemental fondant, uh, what we were talking about a minute ago. But just a few weeks later, the two healthy colonies <coughs> were no more. Lots of dead bees and each hive had a cluster of dead bees around the queen. I thought there was enough food for them. I suspected that although I wrapped the hives, they were caught out by the cold. I've attached some photos. Maggie, you've looked at these photos. What, what do you think's happened to John's colonies? Um, yeah, so you should all be able to see the the first. Uh, so John sent in five photos, so you should all be able to see that that first photo that that's up there now. And hopefully you'll be able to see my uh, pointer on screen. So first thing I kind of notice about this frame, um, it's quite a small cluster of bees uh, here. Um, 
you know, it, they're not sort of over a great amount of, of, of the frame. Um, the other thing I noticed is sort of in the, the sort of top uh, middle, to, slightly off to the left hand side, you've got this area of comb here, which looks like uh, it was um, drone comb sort of uh, probably towards the end of the season. So that that sort of might indicate a bit of an issue with the queen laying drones sort of in, you know, in, in the, the brood area. Um, the fact is not terribly clear, but I, I think that that one there could possibly be a drone. Um, so if we move on to the next picture, so again, this is this is quite a small colony. Um, it's, I'm assuming it's sort of from the same hive. It's it's just the next frame along. So so this quite colony a, did have quite a bit of pollen there actually, Maggie, isn't there in the bottom? Yeah, yeah. So this, this colony it did did have stores. So that there's sealed honey down the side here, and then you you've got uh, pollen and and that sort of here. Um, so so this next photo shows shows the stores. So this sort of white lumpy um, stuff in the cell. So that that's um, granulated uh, honey so uh, it, it's, it's hard to tell without looking under a microscope but it, it's probably ivy honey that, that's crystallized in the cells. Um, you've also got uh, cells of pollen here um, and the reason why they appear shiny is that the bees have uh, put a very sort of thin film of um, nectar over the top of them and that they do that to stop the pollen going um, from going bad. So Generally, if you see shiny nectar like this, th this is quite often a sign that uh, the bees aren't anticipating having to use that um, pollen to feed brood. So, so they're anticipating going broodless, which again kind of hints at uh, what we saw on the first picture, um, that the, the queen had perhaps become a, a drone layer. Uh, so if we move on to the next frame, so this is uh, oh, down into, in, into, the brood, uh, into the brood box. Obviously all the frames have been taken out. Um, and you can see the mesh floor there. Now, obviously there, there, there's dead bees there, but there's not a great deal, you know, there's not a sort of large amount of dead bees there. So, so it probably was quite a, a small colony. And this, this is quite a big box for a small colony like, like that. So um, it would have been very difficult for that sort of number of bees to, to keep that space, space warm. Um, and then, so the final picture that John has sent in, so we've got two super frames here. So this kind of shows that the colony obviously had stores going into the winter. Um, they, they've, they've not eaten those stores, so I don't think starvation um, was uh, was a problem for, for them. Um, so, you know, to me, it looks like there's, there's, it was quite a small colony. Um, there aren't very many dead bees in the bottom of the hive and the cluster is very small. Um, so my diagnosis for this colony would be that the queen failed probably sort of late in the season. Um, this could be down to her sort of being badly mated or it could have been um, sort of a late season supersedure. Um, and if you get sort of too late on into the season, the queen actually isn't able to get out and mate properly. Um, the, the, there isn't the, enough drones about for, for her to mate successfully. Um, so if this colony uh, sort of did have a drone layer, it would have slowly dwindled away because the, the worker bees weren't being replaced with, with other worker bees. Um, so John mentioned in, in, in his email that uh, he had two colonies going into the winter. Um, as I said, it looked quite small. So I I think if I was John, he probably could have rectified the situa situation if he'd realised that the perhaps the colony was, was um, a drone layer. It certainly was small. Um, in my opinion, it's much better off to, to unite smaller colonies um, at, at the end of the season and have sort of bigger, stronger colonies uh, go, going into the winter. Um, so you, there's, there's various methods of doing that, but I think the, the removing one of the queens and then sort of using newspaper to, to unite colonies is, is probably the easiest uh, way to do that. Um, so you can also uh, move smaller colonies in, into, into nukes and polynukes. They're, they're, they're very good for, for overwintering colonies um, if, if you don't want to unite. Um, Bees are unlikely to swarm later on in the season. So if you get to September time, it's OK to congest your bees. And I know beekeepers are often quite reluctant to, to uh, reduce the size of the space down into, into congestion. Um, but uh, that, that, that can be better sort of later, uh, so end of August into September. You want your bees more confined. You want them to be in a smaller space so that they've, they've got that smaller volume to, to keep warm. Um, and, you know, you need to be mindful when you're doing your inspections at the, the end of the season, look at the brood pattern, um, check that it is a nice brood pattern. And if you do suspect that the queen is failing, um, 
if if it's sort of still early enough, then you've potentially got time to requeen. But you you can always unite it with with one of the colonies, uh, one of your other colonies that that has a has a good queen. I think that it, it, often people confuse quality with quantity, and it's not how many colonies you've got; it's the quality it's the quality of the con colonies you do have. And uh, there's always some reluctance at the end of the year, I think, um, to to merge uh, weaker colonies. I, I would rather come out of the out of the winter with maybe three, you know, good colonies and uh, then then lose a load that just on their own don't stand alone. And it doesn't need to be expensive. I think Maggie, you touched upon uh, putting them into a new box. And, I, and one of the most essential pieces of kit that I have in my uh, workshop or, or store is a, a, a poly nuke. And they're great for putting, you know, colonies that you can't merge maybe, but that are too, too small. Uh, you don't have to do it you know you don't have to spend the money on that you can use two pieces of insulation in 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 the hive and reduce the actual hive size down i think that's what you were touching on there john thank you very much for sending those photos in and thank you for your question um i think that was a, a really good question and I, I know some of the themes will come out in other questions um we read the questions by the way um so the next question's from uh nola uh, nola's in bath um i think that's your area actually Eleanor. um uh, is it i don't know so that that kind of way um, she sent a photo asked why one of her colonies has died when there was still honey in the supers and on the frames nearby in the brood box she's described all of the bees as being dead with their heads in the combs and their bottoms sticking up the colony was a large colony with a full brood box and two full supers of honey at the end of august she treated the colony for varroa with uh, maqs mite away quick strips the uh, the, the small strips that you can put in there and um so eleanor um you've got the photo what do you think about that uh, it, it's certainly it's certainly starvation. You can really clearly hear, see here that the bees are face down into the cells. They're licking up the last of the, the stores that were in there and then they've been too weak uh, and they've just died. And you can see some didn't even make it to, into the cells. Uh, they're just they're just dying on the comb. And then obviously the the rest of the brood that's there has uh been chilled because there's no bee adult bees heating it and then that's just died off so it's it's very sad when you see this um they uh you mentioned that there were there was stores in there uh, and it was a large colony so you basically have to pick through possible causes of this uh were they as they said they were treated in June for Varroa. Uh, yeah, and, I think that's what she says with, yeah. with MAQS. Yeah, so so that's that's quite early. Uh, was she testing for Varroa and checking for Varroa after this treatment? So uh, although that will kill off a lot of the Varroa, possibly the population started expanding quite rapidly. And uh, also you might have a, a the colony robbing out another colony that's that's dying from varroasis, therefore bringing the varroa back to the hive, and and so you get this big explosion uh, of the varroa population on your winter bees that are that are the bees that are supposed to live long enough to survive the whole of the winter. The varroa uh, damage itself plus the viruses they carry reduce down that lifespan. Uh, and the bees just start dying off earlier. So the colony shrinks down and shrinks down. Then in the early spring, as the queen starts laying again, you've got really weak, tired bees, small colony, desperately trying to keep this, this um, area hot and warm. They don't really want to abandon that brood that they're looking after. So they eat all the all the food around it, and then they just become too weak to move move area to the to the food. Uh, and and just very sadly, they dwindle away and die. It, it's not you get acute starvation where the, it's sort of a catastrophic event that's happened suddenly. Uh, a nice big colony, nice and expanding, run out of food, and then they all starve and die. And then you just get big piles of dead bees and loads of bees in the cells. Whereas this seems like a just a a gradual die off over the winter, and then the final nail in the coffin really was this. Uh, the sudden expansion of brood, which they just couldn't cope with, and then they've died out. So I, I would say the most likely culprit is, is uh, varroa burden, especially with that treatment so early. 
Uh, and it's really important, whatever you decide to treat, whether it's non-chemical or chemical treatments, that you monitor those varroamites so you know exactly what's going in the hive. There, there is a, um, on bee base, there is a varroa calculator where you can take your mite drop, you can program it into there and it will tell you uh, whether you have to do something now or, or you should start planning on, on when you should do a varroa treatment. That's really, really handy, really useful. Uh, and it, and it's just um, just gives you a nice heads up of when you're supposed to be doing things. Uh, and it's just really important to to just keep an eye on the overall level. Well, you know, I, I totally agree with everything you said there. And I, I think that um, Vero is an ongoing issue that, you know, you have to consider all year round. It's not uh, I don't think anymore you can say it's a once a year treatment. I think you have to be on on top of it all the time. Um, you certainly and, need to monitor it all the time. Precisely. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I, so I, I think, I, I'm um, just going to take take that picture off. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Eleanor. Uh, and thanks, Nola, for uh, from Bath. Um, hope all is well down there. Um, so the next question is from Anne. Uh, Anne's in Warwick. Um, she's asked us how much should she feed her bees in the autumn to improve, improve their chances of surviving the winter? What, what's the recommended um, quantity, Maggie? Um, well, I think I'd, I, so I'd recommend, um, so for your winter preparations, you really need to start preparing for winter after you've taken your summer um, honey crop off. So this is usually sort of early to mid August that you want to be taking uh, taking that honey off um, because you, you do need to treat for, for varroa. Um, and so all of the bees that emerge from mid August onwards, so these are going to be your winter bees. Um, and you want them to be as fit and healthy as possible going into the winter because they have to survive right the way through to, to now, uh, really. So you're looking at a good sort of three, four months um, that, that, that they need to survive for. Um, you also don't want to leave for treating uh, for Varroa um, too late in the season. Um, a lot of these treatments are temperature dependent. And um, so sometimes the weather in September, it can be quite nice and, and, and warm, but you, we can get caught out with, with cold snaps. Um, and particularly if it's cold at night, um, some of these varroa treatments, they won't be as, as effective as, as they should be if the temperatures are uh, sort of dropping down. Um, so a colony, it, for, in terms of stores, it's recommended that a colony has sort of between 16 and 20 kilos um, of stores. So that's, uh, I think that's about sort of 35 to 45 pounds of stores to survive the winter. Um, in terms of a national hive, which is the most common in the UK, uh, with an average size colony, um, so that would be about eight frames of brood uh, in mid-August with uh, a couple of two or three supers um, with sort of a good number of bees in. Uh, so that colony going into the winter, it really should have a full super of stores. So, you know, absolutely sort of ramp up full of stores. And the brood box should be about sort of a third to half full of stores as as well, you know, as, as a minimum. So anything extra to that is, is going to be um, a bit of a bonus. Um, so once you finish a varroa treatment, um, you can sort of offer them feed. So either an invert syrup. Um, so invert syrup's a commercially prepared syrup and you can buy this from beekeeping suppliers. Um, the reason why it's called invert syrup is it's a, a simpler form of sugar to the to the granulated sugar that you'll you'll have in your kitchen, um, and therefore because it's simpler, it's uh, easier for the for the bees to digest as part of that digestion process has already been done. Um, however, there's nothing wrong with uh, feeding sort of homemade syrup. Um, going into winter, I'd, I'd I'd recommend feeding a heavy syrup, so that's a a two to one ratio. Um, it would be two kilos of sugar to every liter of water. That's that's quite an easy way. Of, of sort of get getting those uh, ratios right. Um, so you can use tepid or cold water to, to make up this syrup. Uh, just have a big container with your, your water and your sugar. And as long as you just keep on mixing it, the, the sugar will uh, dissolve. Um, I don't recommend sort of heating your, your syrup uh, as if you, if you don't sort of get it quite right, this can cause it to, um, so HMF to form in, in that syrup. And then if you feed that to your bees, it can can give your bees um, dysentery. So I, yeah, I'd stick with sort of warm and cold water when, when you're making your own syrup up at home. Um, so colonies, they'll, they'll probably consume about, well, an average size colony will probably consume about sort of five litres of syrup. Obviously, larger colonies are going to need more than that. Um, and once you get to about October, 
your, your colonies are going to sort of start reducing in their activity and they might sort of be, become reluctant to take down syrup. So you've got that window between uh, sort of mid-August and, and the end of September to sort of really get the feed into them for, for the winter. Um, They'll also benefit from foraging on, on ivy. So this is like the final source of nectar and pollen uh, that the bees will, will utilise. Um, pollen is important as well. Um, it's important for brood, brood production. Um, and this will probably continue, you know, certainly in the south of the, the country, we don't tend to get many broodless periods um, and the bees will be using that pollen as, as brood fruit, brood food often hunter throughout the throughout the winter uh, also don't forget your mouse guards so uh, once you've kind of finished feeding you, you want to put put some mouse guards on because they, they can make a mess of your combs um, and I'd say beekeepers really sort of need to get into the habit of hefting their hives quite regularly um, so that they learn to kind of gauge the weight and what is a heavy hive uh, and what is a light uh, hive um, if you become concerned sort of over the winter, um, so say from October onwards and you start thinking, oh, crikey, th th this colony is getting a bit light here, um, you can feed a, a fondant. Um, so th again, this can be bought from uh, beekeeping um, suppliers. Uh, you can also use baker's fondant, so that's um, commercially available, but you need to be really careful with that um, because some baker's fondants have uh, anti-caking agencies and, and uh, so other additives and if the baker's fondant has those those sort of additives in that that can also give you colonies dysentery so so do read the uh, ingredients very carefully if, if if you go down that route but anything from a beekeeping supply should should be fine to to put on your your, your colonies um so if you if you do uh, buy it um you'll you'll probably have to wrap the the fondant in plastic uh, and this can be placed sort of on the crown board over over one of the holes cut a hole in the plastic so that the bees can can access it um if you don't wrap it in plastic then the fondant can either dry out and become hard and the bees won't be able to sort of process it and take it down or in very wet conditions it sort of melts and weeps and you end up with this sort of gloopy slop that kind of drip drips onto your bees um but uh, yeah I think uh, that uh, you know a colony should never starve, and and there there are things that that you can do to to help a colony, and and it, uh, certainly feeding early enough after after you treat for varroa is very important, but also monitoring that that hive throughout um, just to just to see if they do if they do need that fondant up later on in the the year. That's great, Maggie. Thanks very much. This uh, I think there's some photos just gone into the chat of. Um uh winter fondant emergency stores um i'm not quite sure who's put those in it's just flagged up on the chat but um thank you to whoever put those up i think it was that ben that put them up there um let me just see yeah uh, no dean thank you dean uh yeah really good photos actually um, can we use those dean <laughs> we're always we're always looking for photos that we can use um Great. Um, so uh, we've got another question here um, about, or oh, back to the old Vera again. It's about parasitic mite syndrome. It's Rosemary from Devon. Good evening, Rosemary. Also, oh, I should have said thank you to Anne from Warwick for that last question. Um, so Rosemary's asking, my bees have dwindled over the winter. There are bees with deformed wing and abdomens. Finally, the bees stopped flying. And when I checked, there are only a few bees on the frames. They're all dead. There was some capped brood, but they were dead with tongues stuck out. They had no shortage of food. What, what What's happened there, Eleanor? You're on mute. <laughs> that was that was mostly umming anyway. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I think I, I think Rosemary's definitely right. I, it certainly sounds like parasitic mite syndrome. You've got the really classic symptoms there, like um, deformed wing. So the 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 varroa mite transmits a virus called deformed wing virus and it's fairly self-descriptive it causes deformed wings it can also deform um, the whole of the the bee's body so you get shortened abdomens uh, and they look really really quite poorly uh, i would ask more questions at this point of rosemary which would be uh, did she treat uh, was she monitoring for varroa the the uh, pupa that remained in the hive uh, she said that they had tongue sticking out it would probably be worth uh, hoiking a couple of them out with some tweezers just have a look see if they've actually got varroa on them or or possibly it might have been a late treatment so uh, certainly this year a lot of people didn't take their honey off in in this area till quite late so varroa treatments went on very very late so you're, you're talking uh, even early october because by that point 
most of your winter bees ha have already been reared. Uh, and so they've they've been reared with this big grower burden. So even though you killed them all off and uh, and over winter you didn't get a mite drop, though those winter bees still had the uh, effect of the virus on them, and they still, uh, you know, had that shortening of lifespan. Yeah, it, it, it's a real shame, and it, it's quite tricky when you've got funny seasons, especially like last year, to get that varroa treatment on at the right time. Uh, but you've got to remember that that varroa treatment has to get rid of those varroa mites before the winter bees start being reared. Uh, and and it, it, we see it so often, I think all of us can say time and time again, a lot of it is is just because of that that late treatment. Some people even only do a winter treatment, so they'll only use oxalic acid in the midwinter because that means that, that those winter bees uh, were, were affected by varroa on really short winters, good winters, they'll survive and they'll survive that year. But but obviously, if, if it's a long drawn out winter, this this winter down here has been quite, quite prolonged and it's been quite mild. And that that puts quite a lot of stress on a, on a beehive. So so they they're just dying off now because that's that shortened lifespan has only got them this far. Uh, and, you know, it, it's not an uncommon sight. Mild winters are actually not the beekeeper's friend, really. A lot of my friends yeah. who don't keep bees think that, oh, it's nice winter, the bees. But of course, they, they use up all their stores because they're out flying, looking for pollen and often, well, certainly nectar that isn't there. So they're going through their stores, burning through those quite quickly. And as you said, it you know it has an Im impact on on, on Varroa and, and them surviving. Now, with Varroa, I, I kind of as a bee farmer, I always worked on a sort of like a not just one treatment a year and, and that's quite often what I hear from um, members of my association or I've treated for Faroe this year well I, I always think that you should actually treat I mean I used to treat three times a year um, in the spring the autumn and then with an oxalic acid over the winter because um, what you're trying to do is target actually those broodless periods really that's the that's the opt optimum time to treat a colony because 80 percent of the Varroa lives in the sealed brood, it's only 20% that lives um, on, on, on the bee, or phoretically as it's known. Um, so actually um, trying to find those times when the uh, the colony is at its lowest amount of brood. And, and actually in the winter, uh, what I, I'm, again, I'm not advocating, I said at the beginning, you know, my ideas are my ideas, but in, in the winter, I would go in and, and actually sacrifice the little brood patches that, that maybe was only a small patch of brood about that big on one or two frames. I would get a fork and sacrifice that knowing that the oxalic acid would penetrate it and and I'd get a much bigger knockdown rate. Um, you often hear of integrated pest management spoken about, um, you know, using a, a range of range of methods to knock it down. But I think the days have gone really where you can probably treat once a year for Vera. I think you need to be on top of it all the time. Lovely. Yeah, Thanks I mean, very much for that. Sorry, Eleanor. Uh, yeah, obviously there are um, just management techniques you, you, you can use to, to reduce and control for uh, They're very, very effective. They, they're usually quite high skilled. So, uh, you know, to to learn how to use them, it, it usually takes a few years to, to just get it right. But, but you can effectively treat for uh, without the use of chemicals. Obviously, we, we talk about chemicals a lot simply because it's a lot easier. <laughs> So, so if you just put a treatment on at the right time of year that's effective and the temperatures are right, then uh, you know you've ticked that box and it's treated the varroa for for that period. But, yeah. but the, obviously, if you don't want to go down that route, you don't you don't just leave them to it. You mm. do manage them in a way that that um, reduces the varroa mite, and and they're very effective. They're very effective. So, Rosemary, thank you very much for your question. Um, we turn now to Frank. Um, Frank's got in touch, I think, Newtown. Newtown, he's from, uh, that's Mid Wales, I think, isn't it, Maggie? Um, Maybe, yeah, area. I, there's lots of Newtowns in the UK. I had a good sized colony in the autumn. I treated for Varroa. The dead cluster was only on a couple of frames in size with heads in cells and drones present. And I think he's sent us a photo, which I think you can share, Maggie. Um. OK, so uh, you should be able to hopefully see that that photo now. Um, so, I mean, th th this photo, it, it, it's very sort of clearly um, a, a drone laying queen. So, again, there's poor old John experienced the, uh, the the queen has failed and, and she's run out of sperm and um, she's laying drones. So you can see that there's a very uneven, uh, the, the very uneven cappings to the to the brood here. Um, 
was obviously quite a big colony when this photo was taken. So uh, the pre the queens probably suddenly failed and suddenly ran out of sperm. Um, and, and, you know, this, this can happen. Um, your, your queen will be laying away quite happily and there'll be lovely brood patterns. And then suddenly um, she, she will run out of sperm and you will, will sort of end up in, in this situation. Um, but regardless of the, the colony size, um, unfortunately, when, when your queen does fail, um, unless you do something about it, that, that colony is, is, is doomed. So, so you do need to, to do something. So I, I actually, I went and I found a photo of, of healthy brood. Um, so it's taken from a slightly different angle. This is sort of flat on, but you can see that it's it's far more um, even than, than the, the previous photo. So, so this is healthy worker brood. Um, you can just about see that the cappings, are, they've got a very, very slight small dome over the top of them. Uh, you know, the, the, the doming on it is nowhere near as, as pronounced as, as it is with, with this. And that the bees have actually sort of built up the size of the cell walls to, to accommodate the, the drones that have been laid there. Um, so, the, you know, my, my advice would be um, try to sort of educate yourself as best as best as you can and be able to identify the signs of a, of a failing queen and, and that you've potentially got got an issue and, you know, learn to sort of be able to distinguish between what what's healthy um, and what, what what sort of potentially might be be pro problematic, um, because then you can actually do do something about it. Um, so my advice to Frank, you know, same thing that I sort of said to, to John at the start of the season, um, he if he noticed this um, sort of August, September time, he, he would have been able to do something about it. So he would have been able to go into this colony, find the queen, dispatch her and then either, you know, perhaps source a queen from, uh, I don't know, his, his association or a beekeeper friend or, or buy a commercially available queen and introduce that. But, um, you know, probably the, the most easiest solution would be to dis dispatch the queen in this failing colony and then unite it with uh, with another one. Um, so at least, then it, you know, you would save uh, the, the the bees that were sort of in that colony, and hopefully that that then larger colony going into the winter would, would survive and make it through. But um, yeah, my my best advice to to beekeepers is is learn these signs and symptoms so that you can identify things and and then uh, deal with them. Yeah, I think it's always a tricky time, isn't it, to find that you've got a drone layer at towards the end of the season. Your your options really are quite limited because yeah. you know clearly there's not the ability to breed another queen and i think you know what a lot of the the, the bigger commercial um, outfits do is they they bre they'll breed a stock of queens in the spring ready just for that situation um and 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 manage to sort of uh, retain them either in queen banks or something like that so yeah that's a great uh, question frank thanks very much um uh, there's a question now. I had a good sized colony. I'm, I'm terribly sorry, but there's no name on this one. So if you ask the question, you know who you are. I had a good sized colony in the autumn and treated for Varroa. I fed syrup until the end of September. However, now they've died in mid January. The cluster was only a couple of frames in size with their heads in cells. I think we're back to that heads in cells thing. There were plenty of stores in the half brood I had left them. Is this isolation starvation? What do you think, Helena? Um. The first question I would ask here is, was there a queen excluder between the brood body and the half half brood? Because uh, uh, obviously the, the bees are going to be reluctant to abandon the queen uh, and go up into that half super if if there was a queen excluder there. Um, with with if, of course, there wasn't a, a queen excluder there and they had complete access to that and they were strong colony going into winter, there's no sort of smoking gun, so to say. There's there, there's no sort of, oh, this is what's caused that. Isolation starvation is basic, it's almost a symptom. It's not a cause. So something is causing those bees to dwindle down so that they're so small that they can't move around in, in the uh, brood body and find that food. So something's causing them, something's shortening their lifespan, something's causing them to, to die off. Uh, and it's, uh, you know, you you start excluding things from that. Was it Varroa? Was it something like Nozema, uh, which is a little spore forming protozoa, which shortens their lifespans? Um, you know, you, you, you start ticking the boxes to see what it see what it is was it a failing queen as maggie was saying is it is it a drone laying queen were there symptoms of that in there uh, and then you you end up on 
possibilities of something a little bit more sinister. So there is the possibility that they've died out from one of the notifiable diseases, EFB or AFB, uh, you know, that just something that was making them weak, may, making them not be able to survive uh, survive the winter. And that's one of the reasons why we always say if you've got a, a, a dead colony that's died out over winter, uh, Firstly, you don't reuse the combs for any of your other colonies. And secondly, you know, you destroy those combs, you sterilise the hive before you put other bees in it. You don't just leave it there for another swarm to come in, just in case there's some nasty disease in there that you don't want to give to a perfectly healthy swarm coming in. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, and obviously the, the advice that I would give is check your other colonies in the spring, have them have a really good check. And if you're at all worried, if you're looking at that brood and going, I don't like the look of that, then we, uh, the National Bee Unit, is there to help. Um, hopefully, if you call us out, we will just put your mind at rest. But, um, you know, if there is an issue there that's much more serious, then we are there to, to help you deal with it uh, and, and get you through it, really, and, and clear it out. So, you know, ho hopefully it's just it, it's just something uh, like a failing queen that they've just dwindled away and, and just not been able to cope but but obviously if it is something more sinister uh, there is something you can do about it. So the, these common themes are coming out throughout these questions virosis, uh, starvation, uh, failed queens really they're the three big ones that we see time and time again from the position we're here at the NBU. So I think we've now got time just for a couple more questions but um, before we go to those I, I'd, I'd I'm going to be uh, um, uh, shameful and uh, uh, or shameless, I should say, and just remind everyone that BeeBase is an amazing source of information. Um, if you haven't done so already, please, would you think about registering your apiaries and your bees? It's um, a really useful source. And, and also by doing so, you're effectively helping the MBU team to to help you really and um, assist us in our commitment to maintaining healthy bees. Um, also, just as a plug for the MBU and this question time event, we're hoping to run uh, further events of this kind throughout the year. So your feedback, first of all, is uh, very, very important. Um, uh, you know, the, the pros and the cons, we, we, we want to hear. If we can improve, we will. Um, so please keep an eye on our news page in, on BeeBase but also on the NBU social media channels that have been set up over the winter. Um, many of you will have noticed that we now got these social media channels. Uh, there's been a lot of work put in over the winter to do this by a, a dedicated team from the NBU. So we're pleased to sort of do that. Um, there's lots and lots of questions coming in. So we've we've certainly got the uh, the material for another question time and, and lots of great, great comments. And thank you very much to you all for taking the time and joining us and, and giving us your comments. So we move on to Brian. He's said a photo, uh, Maggie, of a brood comb, and he's asking, I've kept some old frames from a colony that died last year, I think as a, a result of a drone laying queen. I'm not sure how old it is, but would this be acceptable to use in a colony or nuke in the coming season? Maggie, I, I know you will want to answer this question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Brian. Um, so yeah, this is this is one of my my pet peeves. Um, it really it really um, I have I've lectured many a beekeeper on their dirty combs. Um, so I don't I really don't understand why beekeepers um, insist on reusing sort of old manky combs like this. So I'm sure uh, many beekeepers would probably turn around and say the, 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 this this frame. So the, the picture I've shared that's absolutely fine. There's no there's nothing wrong with it. It's perfectly good drawn comb. And and, you know, obviously the bees do do put sort of quite a bit of energy into producing that wax and drawing that comb. Um, but that, you know, that that is uh, quite a dirty, manky old bit of, bit of comb. Um, and I think the thing that frustrates me is that, you know, we're, we're, we're beekeepers and um, we can't just consider the bees when, when we keep bees. We have to think of the bees as a super organism. Um, so it's not just the insects themselves that you have to think about. You also have to think about uh, the combs and the hive itself, because that that they also form part of that that super organism. Um, so the combs they're effectively the the excretory system of that of that super organism. So you're sort of thinking if you think of it in terms of the, the liver and the kidneys. Um, and bees will swarm uh, to reproduce, but you know also part of that swarming process is that they they leave behind their their old comb and they produce new comb. Um, so if you if you're using dirty combs like this, uh, so things like pollutants, exhaust fumes, chemicals in the environment, they're, they're going to build up in the in the 
the combs and in the hives, um, also sort of residues from things like varroa treatments um, and pathogens for things like minor brood disorders. Um, so they'll also build up. So things like chalk brood spores, um, the sac brood virus, that, that will be present uh, in, in the old combs. So, you know, if you do insist on keeping uh, the, the, these old dirty combs, you're, you're not really doing the bees any favours. Um, the bees can be really working really hard to sort of overcome something like sac brood. Uh, you know, they'll, they'll be pulling out the infected larvae. They'll be they'll be doing their best to sort of keep things clean. But if you've got this old comb there, um, you're effectively just perpetuating that that infection. And, you know, OK, while something like sac brood is not a notifiable disease, but that doesn't mean that it's not serious, um, you know, because after all, this virus will be killing a proportion of your, your bees and it will be weakening um, your, your colony and you're effectively constantly sort of re reinfecting them. Uh, you know, and, and another drawback of these sort of old dark um, frames that have been in, in use for sort of three, four, five seasons. Um, so as they darken with age, um, the, the diameter of the cells actually reduces. So each time uh, a larvae pupates, uh, it will spin a cocoon and this cocoon gets left behind in the cell and it will make that cell slightly smaller. So every subsequent bee that sort of then hatches out from that, that cell uh, is going to be a tiny bit smaller. So it's going to have a slightly shorter lifespan. Um, it's going to be able to carry less nectar in, it, in its honey stomach. Um, and you, you, you're effectively weakening your col colony because if, if every bee is sort of hatching out from smaller cells, all of your bees are going to be smaller, they're all going to be slightly less productive and that just exacerbates sort of over time. Um, you know, foundation really isn't isn't expensive and, you know, I, I find it quite enjoyable to save up my old wax, melt it down, uh, clean it up and um, a lot of the beekeeping supplies, they, they'll do an exchange process, so that that old wax is actually worth something. You can get you know, money off vouchers or you can trade it in for, for new wax. Um, so I'd really recommend that, you know, going into this season, have a look at your combs and ask yourself, when was the last time I changed them? Um, you know, and if it's more than three years, then, you know, really sort of sh shame on you. You, you. you should sort of be thinking about doing something about it th th this season. Um, so it's easy to change out combs. Um, you can either do it, do it all in one go and do something like a shook swarm um, or a Bailey comb change. Uh, and there, there, there's very, you know, B base, BBKA website, WBKA website, they, they've all got information on how to do these techniques that they're, they're relatively straightforward um, and don't sort of re require a lot of technical ability. Um, I know some beekeepers that they, they can be reluctant to do it because you are sort of losing some of that brood. Um, but if you do it early enough in the season when there's not much brood and you, you feed, um, so I'd say feed a light syrup, which would be a one to one syrup. So one a uh, kilo of sugar to one one litre of water. Uh, if you do the shook swarm and, and give them a good, good strong feed, then the bees will draw out that foundation and, and pull out new comb. And, and they, you, re, you really will notice them thrive and they, they do bounce back remarkably quickly and, and really do benefit from that. Um, but as you know, as a minimum, if, if you're not prepared to, to take all of your brood frames and change them all out, um, if you can change sort of a third of your, your, your brood combs every season, so that would be sort of taking out the worst three or four frames each year. Um, so at the end of the season, you can move those to the, to the outer sides of the uh, edges of the brood box. And then when you go in in the spring, they should be empty. So they should be sort of free of stores and, fr and free of brood. You can just take them out, replace them with um, with fresh foundation. And if you do that every year and, and you're replacing three or four frames every year, then effectively you've got this rolling cycle where you've always got new new comb going in. Um, so that, that that's another sort of effective, easy way to, to do it. But um, yeah, dirty old frames like this. Sorry, that's just an I, excuse I really for it. love that question. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, yeah, it's really my, my sort of pet peeve, that one. So. <laughs> Brian, thank you for your question. I, I, I'll just uh, bring it back to my experience as a bee farmer. I, I used to manage about 200 colonies there or thereabouts. So every year I would be sort of um, shook swarming about 60, uh, which gave me a bit of work to do over the winter because um, I, I try and do it every three years. And that answers Kate Martin's question. Um, I think Maggie had done that anyway. So, Kate, thanks for your question. Um, th three years is about, you know, right, really. Um, and, and I favour shook swarm. Um, I just think that uh, if you feed the colony once you've shaken it onto new wax, 
um, they, they seem to explode into life. It gives them, a, I, I think, anyway, it gives them a, a whole new lease of life. And they, um, and, and I often get beekeepers um, saying to me, well, you know, you're losing a lot of brood. Well, I suppose you are, but you know what? You're also losing a lot of varroa because 80% of the varroa lives in the brood anyway. So you're giving them a whole new lease of life. And and if at the same time that you shake them in, you then use a, you know, a, a, a varroa treatment, you're you're not only losing all of the varroa in the sealed cells, but you can then knock down the varroa that is living on the bees too. And you're, you know, you're almost reaching 100%, um, you know, of knockdown. I don't think you'll ever reach that, but something close. Um, so great that was a fantastic question thank you uh so uh, i think final question of the evening ladies and gentlemen and uh we haven't i'm surprised actually we haven't got to this we it's taken to to this point to get to this question and it's from simon who's in swindon um he's concerned about one of his colonies which is dwindling he hasn't sent in a photo but he's noticed brown smears on the front of the hive which he thinks is dysentery eleanor what would your advice be to simon uh, it certainly sounds like dysentery. Uh, it's it's very common at this time of year, especially in Somerset. We we have damp in Somerset, so dysentery is quite often caused by fermenting stores or spoiled stores. Uh, so so as the bees are consuming that, uh, they they're running out of the good food. They're now onto the spoiled stores, and and it's affecting them, and and it's causing dysentery. The important thing to do is make sure the hive is sound. So if there's damp getting into the hive, so if there's a damage on the roof and, and water is leaking in, uh, lift the top off. If you've got mould on, on the top of the on the top of the um, crown board, you probably have a, a problem with the hive. So you might want to pop the bees on a night on a warm, the warmest day you can get at this time of year, put them in a fresh hive. If they've dwindled down, pop them into a nuke so that they can they can keep nice and warm and then feed them. Uh, inverted sugar syrup or, or or fresh syrup, just to just to tide them over, just to get their stomachs cleaned out, so so they're onto some nice fresh fresh food, and and you're getting rid of that spoiled stores. Uh, no um, dysentery used to be really commonly associated with nosema, so uh, nosema is a spore forming protozoa, uh, which uh, of which there are two common varieties. Nosema apis and Nosema serrana. Uh, they're, they're really common and much like a lot of these things, there's not there, it's not massively symptomatic, but you just get a dwindling of the colony because it shortens their lifespan and they and they die off. Uh, dysentery is not a symptom of Nosema, but it can spread it very, very quickly throughout a, throughout a hive. So if you've got a few individuals in there with it, then with dysentery, it's going to go crazy in there uh, and obviously really affect the colony. Now, there aren't any um, chemical or licensed veterinary medicines for, for this, but basically you do the same thing as you would with dysentery, which is take jobs away from them. You know, shrink the hive down to the right size for them. So you can do this in a, in a hive anyway, take out the frames that they're not on, put put insulation material, as John said earlier, you can put insulation material if you don't have a new, new box. Just keep those bees nice and warm, uh, feed them so that they don't have to go out and forage and, um, uh, you know, just just take away a few of their jobs so they're less stressed and then and then they can just recover. Uh, and hopefully that will give them enough time, enough space, enough jobs away from them that that they will just recover naturally and then the, the colony will just start to expand. So Ang Angus, I've just noticed, has asked, um, can you get brown smears at the entrance um, from cleansing flights after long periods of wet and cold? We do tend to see that as well, don't we? Yeah, it, it's sort of it's a little bit different. So so the dysentery smears are, are you know, really quite pronounced. They're, they're sort of noticeably just sort of big, messy splats. And if you lift the crown board off, you'll see splats in, inside the hive as well and on the combs. It, yeah. It's really awful. It, it is it's. When you've seen dysentery, it's different from cleansing flight. So, so uh, you know, cleansing flight, you go, oh, that's cleansing flight. It, it's just little spots. They haven't quite made it out of the hive rather than it's everywhere. And no sema, um, no sema really can only be actually fully diagnosed under a microscope. So yeah. you're probably not going to know visually what it is. Well, ladies and gentlemen, um, I think, unfortunately, that will have to be our last question. We're running out of time. Um, 
I do hope you all enjoyed this um, and we'll keep an eye on our social media channels for um, the next MBU question time. As always, I'm so sorry. There are a lot of unanswered questions. I've tried to get to them. We've, we've, we've had some people working behind the scenes trying to answer your questions as well. Um, I just hope the selection we chose covered the majority of, uh, of, of what we were being asked. Um, however, what we will try and do is answer all of the questions and put those in the comments section of, of this presentation, which, as we said earlier, is being recorded. Um, so if we haven't answered your question um, and you've got another one, maybe you want to ask them, please uh, submit that and any feedback that you have to beekeepers at apha.gov.uk. Now, before I go, the last thing I've got to do is thank the team, um, Maggie Gill and her team, uh, Eleanor, and behind the scenes, the people you haven't seen, um, Avril Earl and Ben Bowen, who have been uh, instrumental, the four of them. I'm, I've really come along at the last minute and um, and I've been the voice piece, uh, really. Uh, so I'm really done, done any work. Um, so I just want to thank those, those four people for all the work they've done.